So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, November the 24th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 234. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be, but we're doing something different today. Uh, we're doing a live stream. So I know it wasn't planned very much in advance. I think 45 minutes ago, I put the information up. And uh, somebody wants to pop in and ask a question, they can. Why not just have a discussion? Because it's Friday, Black Friday. It's not safe to be outside. So just in case somebody decides to show up, let me go ahead and uh, do some questions that were submitted over the past week. So we'll start off with that. First one comes from Janet. And uh, from Downington, Pennsylvania, it says, Fred, would you please please review this article on hive insulation and give us your thoughts. The title is Research Challenges Widespread Belief that Honeybees Naturally Insulate. Okay, so that's not actually a study. It's not a published study. It's something that they're asking for. They want to revisit the whole discussion about whether or not uh, bees provide their own insulation in the cluster in wintertime through that outer mantle of older bees. So look, there's two people here. Brian and uh, EJ and Tritone. Brian, I don't know how you have the time to make your own videos and show up here. This is unplanned. So the fact that three people showed up, that's, that's amazing. So anyway, uh, we'll go ahead and answer another question that was submitted. If you have a question and you want to write it to our topic that you want to talk about, put it over in the comment section and we'll pick up on it. But here's one from Bryce Bennett. It says, uh, on cold days when the bees fly out for just an hour or less, do all the bees get to poop or is there a poop hierarchy? So maybe we could say desiccate or droppings or anyway, you know, not every bee flies out when it's clear. Uh, they need to do what's called cleansing flights. They have to empty their gut. They could be carrying 30% of their own body weight in waste material. So we know the nurse bees don't fly out. Uh, older bees in the hive do. Undertaker bees have to fly out, so you'll see those dying in the snow. Uh, the queen doesn't fly out. She's taken care of. There's Ian from the UK. I'll just pop in and say hi to different people. If you guys have something uh, you want to talk about, let me know. I'm glad that you're here. Kind of skating out because this is easier for me to sit here live and talk than it is to do a full-blown Q&A and then have to edit it and everything. So we're just going to fill the time, and I know it's middle of the day, and if you're on the West Coast, you know, you're two hours behind us. So anyway, bees that fly out to go to the bathroom. One of the things that I get questions about, too, is what about the queen? Well, the nurse bees, her retinue around the queen, take care of her waste material. So she does not have to go outside in the cold to eliminate. Uh, here comes from Bounce Them. Have bees ever swarmed with five full frames in a 10-frame hive? Have bees ever swarmed with five full frames in a 10-framed hive? Okay, here's the thing. For the people to count the bees, to see how many really depart the hive. Because when it's happening, it looks like they're all flying out. The average is 50%. So if you had 10 frames, it was all brewed and covered with bees. You could expect 50% of those. So that would be five frames. Uh, up to 70% of the population departs in a prime swarm. And by that, I mean first swarms in spring a mature queen that's laying and a colony that's building up fast behind them. I think, you know what, it's really widely variable, the percentage of bees that are actually flying out when there's a swarm. But 50% uh, pretty standard, 70 also not unheard of, 70%. So that would be seven out of 10 frames covered in bees. So here's uh, Dana. Some of my bees are bringing in pollen yet, and this is in PA. I have my suspicions about this late season pollen because Dana's not the only one to bring it up. Uh, I think somebody's putting out pollen subs and I think that uh, your bees are getting to it. Because if you walk the countryside, which I do, be careful, by the way, starting Saturday, deer hunting season in Pennsylvania. So people will be out there with their rifles and these are not some of the best shots in the woods, if you know what I mean. Um, but I don't find any pollen this time of year. What would be the source of it? So if you have other beekeepers around you, I highly suspect that they're getting pollen um, from pollen subs that somebody must be putting out when the weather's warm. So that's in my same state. 
So let's get down the line here. Uh, do, 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 do. Have you read this article from Derek Mitchell about the winter cluster? Yes, I mentioned that in the very beginning. Uh, by the way, the article is just that. So we talk about mechanical engineering backgrounds, people with physics backgrounds, looking at the winter cluster of the bees and challenging whether or not they are really insulating themselves with the bees. Uh, the article is really a request for a deeper look into it. So it's not a published study. Uh, the establishment of what bees are doing when they cluster, and of course the argument of the article is that we need to really consider the lack of insulation that are in the hives that are in use today and uh, three quarters of an inch of pine, whatever it happens to be. And then the bees ability to regulate their heat. So instead of saying that they're insulating, the topic that they want to address is maybe they're a heat sink. For me, that's not a huge difference. You know, they cluster tighter, they preserve the warmth in the middle of the cluster. And uh, then of course the cluster loosens up and the physical body of the bees being there, the amount of heat that their body carries, the amount of moisture in their bodies also is where the heat sink part comes in. So um, they're just requesting that there's more of a study. In other words, it's not very revelatory uh, when we're talking about the number of bees, what the real purpose is of the mantle. We know the older bees are on the outside, younger bees to the inside, queen protected, brood in the center, 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, so I think, great, if somebody wants to do another study, because by the way, the ground is well covered by entomologists who've done the studies, but I guess... Um, engineering principles can be brought into play when we're looking at materials, thermodynamics, and everything else. For me, you know, I think, and for the backyard beekeeper, when you modify your, you know, configurations and you're looking at the way they're getting through winter year after year, uh, you'll start to realize uh, if the bees are making it and they're strong and the populations are up in spring, then understanding that you can improve that wintering dynamic and reduce stress because that's also one of the principles of the article. It's a kind of a veiled uh, request to look into honeybee suffrage. So insect stress levels. So it's beyond just the physics of how they're exchanging moisture, how humidity is managed, how warmth is managed, but whether or not a beekeeper is stressing bees and then now it's the, we should not stress bees. So that's also part of it that they're requesting that they look into that more. So again, it's a it's a call for information. So kind of what we used to call an RFI, request for information. Hey, I'm wondering if this is really happening and if we're stressing bees and if we're stressing bees, should we stress them? Shouldn't we be nice to those bees? And uh, so anything's possible. Uh, I look forward to an actual study coming out because that's the real, it's just, you know, they're spitballing and he did publish a request for that uh, further study. Let's go down the line here, read from Derek. So hi, hi, hi. And I uh, hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. I know I did, by the way, I had a birthday recently and I have three sisters. I'm wearing a vest that's heated. There's a battery in the pocket. This thing is heating itself. So that was my birthday uh, present. So that was pretty much fun. Anyway, uh, insulated hives where I peeked in through my well-insulated hive, a nine inch or a nine degree evening, minus nine. My bees were active and this is in the Arctic. Better survival with insulation. Now this is EJ Arctic beekeeping. When you say better survival with insulation, better than what, dead or levels of survival or levels of stress? Because there are people surviving with 100% survival in my bee club uh, that don't insulate. So then the question is levels of survival. And this is the, this is the mucky area. Uh, if you have a high population in spring, right in tune with when the spring blooms happened and when the pollination is needed, uh, if they're already on par with that, we could say that more insulation would be better. But I always question, is more insulation necessary. So how much better is better? And uh, so this thing that goes back to the article that we referred to early on today is um, our bees suffering with less insulation. So I know I made that transition to insulation on the top. I have hives that are insulated sidewalls, uninsulated, because see, there's, there are other things in play. 
we get those warm uh, where I live, I, we don't get minus nine. So we do. If we get like minus 20 or something like that, that's momentary. That's not a, a static environment that our bees are in in wintertime. But so here's my argument or debate or discussion contrary to the insulated hives, right? And here's why we have the problem. They both work. Insulated hives work. The three quarter inch pine hives with insulated covers, those work. Uh, high populated colonies with venting through the top, those work. The question is the configurations combined with the size of the colony and then the weather conditions in which you live, humidity levels and everything else all play. One of the things that I like is going out on one of those days when it's 32 degrees, which by the way, in the middle of winter, I can feel really cold unless the sun shines. 32 degrees, sun shining, the uninsulated hives are doing their cleansing flights. The insulated hives are not even active yet. So the discussion that maybe they're active inside because it's insulated, so maybe the cluster is a little more loose, uh, is different from the front of the hive facing south, getting warmed up from that mid-afternoon sun, and then the bees flying out and doing cleansing flights, while the others, the others haven't even realized in the insulated hives, well protected, that it has warmed outside and that they could be doing the cleansing flights that these are doing. So they perform much later and they interact with the outside of the hive later than those that are just well built and not insulated. So for insulated, we have Apame. I've got the Lysen hives this year. And of course the uh, Layens hives that are insulated with sheep wool. And then we have all the uninsulated hives, including by the way, my observation hives are not insulated. I have double bubble over them, just kind of like a pillowcase of that. And I have monitors on those. But again, I'm not, we're not going to consistently be at minus nine degrees Fahrenheit here. Um, so Arctic, you would be in a position, I have to say this, if I lived in an Arctic region, if I lived anywhere near Ian Stepler, for example, I would have maximum insulation. Ian puts all of his bees inside a building that's climate controlled. You would have to do something. But where I live, the, the wide you know range of temperatures week by week, month by month, uh, does not justify for me heavily insulated hives, being that they're all coming out pretty equal in spring. So if you started losing bees, we have to really take a look. Or if you've got very small clusters of bees in spring and they did have a hard time getting through winter and they consumed all of their resources, have to take a look at that. That's what caused me to move on to insulated covers. That's what caused me to stop using top venting and upper entrances. And I realized that my wintering success was exponentially improved here in Northwestern Pennsylvania. So there's a lot of variables and this is what I always say and to EJ, which I'm sure he's already worked it out, but, um, at Jen Tardif, you know, he does his studies in the Klondike. You know, I can't help but think of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Yukon Cornelius and all that stuff. But anyway, when you have places like that that are in weather extremes, I think you have to insulate or you're gonna, your hives are going to be dead. So if your hives are dead, you definitely need to change something. Where I live, they're doing extremely well. So I have a good test area, but the weather dynamic is... is um, Gives me lots of opportunity to evaluate this year. The ivory bee hive, I V R Y TAC B, uh, is insulated, fully loaded with bees. Uh, we're going to see how that goes. But uh, Sarah says, Happy birthday. That's why I don't tell people about my birthday because it's not that I don't want to thank people for saying it, but when you get to a certain age, it shouldn't even matter. You should be able to opt out of birthday celebrations past 60. That's all I'm saying. Okay. So people say, Happy Thanksgiving. Castle Hives, appreciate the order. What you guys going out Monday morning? Are we doing transactions? Brian, are you selling, buying and selling in my chat over here on the side? So, oh, Grayson's here? Yep. Okay, so what's cool is a lot of these people we're going to see in January, I hope. Hope you all make it. Oh, Brian tosses me $10 for the Shrew Defense Fund. I really appreciate that. And uh, haven't seen any shrews around here yet this year, but I'm ready for them. So that's not a shrew. That's a that's a rat. But it's just to remind me that we're not alone in the world. 
those of you who are having problems with rodents moving into your spaces, um, I was using the Dizzy Dunker. So I don't know if you've seen the Dizzy Dunker or heard of the Dizzy Dunker, but if you've got mice or I don't think it's going to work very well with rats, but for mice, it took them out. They were right in my basement, walking the concrete walls, and uh, they just walk in and you collect them and you can hand them out to your friends because they're alive and unharmed and you can give them as Christmas gifts or whatever you want to do with the mice that you collect. And so uh, Glenn's Natural Honey says, any thoughts on the new Hive Hugger vacuum sealed top covers? Any thoughts on the new Hive Hugger vacuum sealed top covers? I don't know anything about those. Now I have to make a note. Anybody else that's uh, watching right now have used this Hive Hugger vacuum sealed top covers? So what does that do? Is it an insulated cover? Does it is it part of a wrap system? Explain how that works so that uh, the rest of us will know something about it. And that's a good shout out for today, probably. Look into the Hive Hugger insulated cover. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, Shannon Lyon says, I have a Hive Hugger on a late October Virgin Queen and just ordered more crowns from Hive Hugger. So is that the website? It's a Hive Hugger website. This is why, you know what? I'm glad I did this live today because now I can at least look into that. Another thing I want to know, since we're all live sitting around doing nothing on a Friday after Thanksgiving, thank goodness you're in front of your computer and not out where people are because I heard it's bad. Like you go into stores, you run into a lot of people. Oh, I see what we're saying. They use a vacuum form. I think this is that really thin, super high R value stuff that I was reading about. I think I do know something about the material. I did not know about it configured for beehives yet. But I see what we're talking about now. It's a very thin material that has a high R value. I think it was pretty pricey stuff, by the way. Uh, let's see. Flower Street Farm Bees. Is your building with your observation hives heated or unheated? I'm thinking of installing mine in my unheated honey shed. I'll tell you right now, Flower Street Farm Bees, it's unheated. And uh, I used to lose my observation hive bees every single winter because I'm not that bright. So but my first highs were from Bonterra bees, and they came in pairs. So you had double deeps, four high, right? So eight deep frames in an observation hive. But when I shifted that, I realized, you know what? Because I put foam insulation boards on them and everything else, but it's an unheated building. This building is also unheated. All the windows face south. So if I get a warm day in the wintertime, if it's like 40 outside on a sunny day, it'll be 60 inside the building. So that's one bonus. The second part is all of my hives now, if it's an observation hive, they're in triples. So I have three deeps with a single you know, frame sandwich between two. So they have a center frame that they can cluster around and control and keep warm and survive while they migrate up through winter. Since I did that, 100% survival of observation hives inside an unheated building right here in northwestern Pennsylvania. So that works extremely well if you have them in triples. Of course, that means you have four surfaces inside in your observation hive that you can't observe. And for me, that's okay. And that's why I have so many of the hives. By the way, I'm going to add another observation hive in the same building. You cannot have too many observation hives. I think a whole bunch of them in one building would be fantastic because they also, they throw off a little warmth. They're about eight degrees warmer um, underneath the double bubble covers that are on them than what the temperature is inside the hive. But if you do them in triples and three or higher, so that's the magic. So you have nine deep frames, so three high, three groups, right? And uh, if you have that configuration, and again, the bees closed off all the top venting on their own, didn't have to do it. They seal up all the screen and everything else. The only vent is through the bottom. And then, of course, there's an entrance. The entrance faces south. They're all doing fantastic. I'm going to continue with that uh, design because they work extremely well. The only thing I would say for those of you who are thinking about observation hives, um, 
you want glass, tempered glass. So horizontal bees, uh, when they built my hive that was on exhibit at Hive Life last year in January, uh, that's the one I spec'd out for them that has my acoustic chambers in it and everything for recording audio of bees. That is tempered glass. I wish every single one of my hives had tempered glass because you can clean it, take photos through it. You see everything better. Everything is better with tempered glass. So I hope that answers the question. Let's see. Uh, Flower Street Farm Bees. It's been in front of my room, of my house, and I take it out every fall, but thinking of keeping it in all year long. Yeah, they're designed to be inside. So Shannon Lyons says she had it test with Dr. Spivak and Etienne Tardif. What was tested? Oh, that insulation? Is that what we're talking about? The hive hugger? So I wonder what Dr. Spivak, what did Marla have to do with insulated hives in Minnesota at the Spivak lab? That's interesting. She's going to be at the Honeybee, you know, the January conference, the Honeybee Expo. So she's a good person to catch up with. Uh, let's see what else we have going. Eight frame as well, two across, four down. Yeah, the two across, this is from Flower Street Farms. The two by twos don't do well outside. They just don't. Triples, they seem to be able to make it. And if you have those trap panels, that's what I'm doing this year is making cover panels that go on and they're held on with magnets. I like that. And using double bubble in between the glass and the outside. So, but they're already doing well. So anything else would just be a tiny improvement. So that'll be cool. Let's see what else we have going on. Keith Billman, and that's half tracks. And it's a nice sunny afternoon where Keith is. Good for you, Keith. That's great. Thanks for sharing. It's awesome. Uh, what else do we have? Hi, Hugger, the condensing hive. All right. Anybody else have a question or something we should be talking about? Bring up new products. If you know of something that's out there and you've got these hive huggers and they're working good, might as well let people know. What's a price point on that for a hive hugger top? What are we talking about? Condensing hives. To do, to do. Making the whole sun is shining. That's Steve Amos. So nobody else has any questions or topics. Hello from the sunny foothills of North Carolina. And uh, we're in Colorado with probably similar winters. Do y'all have snow yet? Colorado must have some snow. Let's see what else is going on. Hope I'm not missing anything on this feed. I see that the times and the dates, 323. All right. It's uh, 33 to 42 for the top, $88 for a complete double deep wrap, free shipping. So that's from Shannon Lyons. So after this chat is over with, because uh, I don't think it will let you link a website or something like that. But uh, after the live chat's over, you'll be able to put comments in. And if there's a link on the comment, it automatically gets held. But please link the source for the Hive Huggers. And we'll put that down in the video description. So those who didn't make it to the live party, then uh, the gathering of minds here, then uh, they'll be able to check it out and uh, see how that's going. Let's see, snow in Denver, Halloween weekend, Denver, blah, blah, blah. Okay. To leave Hive Life fondant on all winter, someone suggested it would absorb moisture and drip on the bees. So that's from Glenn's Natural Honey. It is okay to leave Hive Life fondant on all winter. If someone suggested that it would absorb moisture and drip on the bees, I don't know if it can absorb moisture, but it does get condensation formed on it, which helps the bees metabolize it. Um, the Hive Life fondant would not drip down on the bees unless it really got soaked. Uh, because the reason I say that is because in spring, if you have leftovers, you can put it in a bucket and mix it with water and turn it into a syrup that you can then feed back to your bees. But uh, I've never seen it actually um, get wet and it's designed to be on all winter long. So mine's out there. Once you start, don't stop. In other words, better to have not fed them anything than to start it and then remove it and have nothing afterwards because the bees do get used to having a resource right there. And uh, the good news is they're all 
in it. And once they eat past that little hole, uh, so if you've cut your little hole in your fondant pack, just happen to have one right here. These are the five pound versions, by the way. You cut that little hole right here, it is not gonna pour out of that hole because what they're gonna do is they eat up through to the back of this plastic and then they'll start to widen it out. So then you've got plastic underneath of it and the bees will consume it because look at it this way. If it's warm enough to melt out and drip down, it's warm enough for the bees to be out of cluster and to be moving around and consuming it. So unless you're living in a really hot area, I think it's, it's fantastic for a cold area. If you're in a hot area, I could see maybe it would drip. I don't know, but because uh, I don't leave it on definitely in the summer. But uh, it would absorb moisture and drip down. I've not seen or heard of that. So, and this is my second year using it. So, second winter. Let's see what else. Uh, I linked the Hive Hugger site. I think her research video towards the end. Okay, that's interesting stuff. I've heard interesting things about that. Uh, kind of new insulation material. Let's uh, let's see what else. Uh, Fred, I had most of my small hives abscond in one yard this fall. No mite issues, but a lot of beetles in late summer would beetles cause them all to abscond. Let me tell you something. That's from Steve Amos, by the way. For those who have the small hive beetles, I don't have them. Sorry, I don't have them. But I know that if they start sliming out your... Um, your stored honey, your capped honey, and they move into that, it will push the bees out of there. Now, here's another thing that I think about when it comes to late season bees absconding. And by that, for those of you who don't know, all the bees are gone. Somebody goes to look in a hive, maybe to fortify the winter stores or something like that, and they find no bees, an empty hive, and often even with honey in there and capped honey. So here's what I think is happening. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think... I think they lost their queen and uh, based on the observations I've made with my own hives and how much drift there is, I think when they're absent a queen at the end of the year, they kind of know they're doomed. And I think they just joined up with other colonies. Uh, people, bees, uh, beekeepers can uh, cause their bees to abscond by harassing them. In other words, you're opening your hive too often. You're doing too much manipulation late in the year that can cause them to leave to certain death. Now, if they've lost their queen, though, which happens a lot more than people realize, I think the bees are not so much absconding in mass, you know, like all at once, all of them leave. I think they're just dribbling out and going to a bunch of different hives. And I think that if we had the ability to know exactly where every single bee went, I think we would find that some other hives nearby got a bee boost and that you just have an empty colony now. Because in the absence of a queen, we have no queen pheromone. We've lost the ability to bind them together. And without a bunch of new resources coming in, the chances of your worker bees activating their ovaries and becoming laying workers late in the year when the weather's getting colder is unlikely. I think they just moved out, moved in with other bees. That's just pure speculation. But when it happens like that and you haven't seen evidence of disease and everything else, also there's no brood behind. So they've been broodless for a while. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to something else. We're coming up here on the end of December or end of November, 1st of December. This for my neck of the woods is your low brood area. We do have some warm days forecast down the line. And by warm, I mean high 50s and sunny. That's going to be some of your opportunity for treating. That's your last hit on the varroa destructor mites. For those of you who treat, if you want to do oxalic acid, this is your chance to let them have it because this is your one-two punch for those colonies that had a persistent population of mites in them, this will be your chance to hit them. So look at the next week or two and the warmest day in there, sunny in 50 or overcast in low 60s, that's your chance. The clusters are a little loose, would make no difference day or night if you've got the ability to treat them through the back wall, for example. But just a reminder, get you thinking about it, this is your chance to get them. Uh, what else do we have here? I'd like to hear about your career path. This is Philip Morse, RTX Honeybees. I'd like to hear more about your career path leading to bee informationalist, not just beginning with your interest in bees, but back when you were younger. I don't think anybody wants to hear that, but I can tell you for sure, much like my grandson, who's eight, knows exactly what he wants to do for the rest of his life, I was going to be a herpetologist, so... 
I was into reptiles and amphibians as a kid, orphology is snakes specifically. That's what I wanted to do is be an expert. But let me explain and why this is important to the adults that are sitting out there right now. If you have a child that comes up to you and has a lot of questions about what you do for a living and it's interesting, or that child has a hobby or an interest that you just happen to be an expert in, right? Give your time to that kid because I think that was the biggest impact on me as a preschooler and as a first grader. I was lucky enough in a town called Maryville, Missouri. They had Northwest Missouri State University there. And at the foot of my street was a uh, biologist, a field biologist, they called him. And his name was David Easterly. Um, this guy showed up in a truck, a Grand Wagoneer, and he had those like safari pants on and the big boots. And he had muslin bags with stuff in them. And when I would see that guy pull into his driveway, I knew that if he got in his house, he was not going to answer the door. But if I could get down there, and intercept him before he went from his truck to the house. He would sit down and talk to me like I was a person. And he showed me the reptiles that he collected. He showed me venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes. And he showed me how to hold a snake. And he showed me how to walk through a horse pasture, which was just across Peach Creek right there. And this guy gave his time to a little kid that wouldn't shut up because I was one of those kids. I was a motor mouth. I was constantly asking questions. And uh, I think that had a lot to do with wanting to be a herpetologist. So that's, that's going to my beginnings, but anything alive, anything out in nature, anything in the world, you know, that was outside, which is a place unfamiliar to a lot of kids today. Uh, I just wanted to learn about life sciences. So yeah, that's my background on that. Studied everything. I was the youngest member of the St. Louis Herpetological Society many years later, eighth grade. And I met someone a lot of you might know. His name was Marlon Perkins. He did uh, uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. So he ran their conservation program. They recruited him from the St. Louis Zoo. And he came back with his wife to the St. Louis Herpetological Society annual picnic at Babbler Park. So it was like meeting a superhero. He was better than YouTubers. He was a big deal. Marlon Perkins. Anyway, so reptiles and amphibians were always the thing. Bees came much later because I was concerned about bees, but I've always been interested in nature. Thanks for asking. Uh, and I don't know if that's much of a career path. So, yeah, but that's, that's where I'm at. Steve Amos, I wish I had the time to harass them too much. Only minor sliming more moth damage. Okay, that does not sound fun. There's Rodney Middleton. Hey, Rodney. See, it's good. Now I can say hey instead of having to click and put a heart on somebody's comment and then comment to everybody. Now we're live. We just talk and get it out of there. Grew up in, grew up on Marlon Perkins, Anita says. Well, who didn't? And Jim, the guy would jump in the water and wrestle anacondas and everything else. And Jim, ran the he did a show called the st louis zoo show where he would bring animals on so st louis was such a great place uh steve amos since fred won't ask hit the like button yeah if you like it you go right ahead lambrick farm happy black friday yeah what's everybody buying today by the way other than this hive hugger shrink wrap thing what's everybody buying for their beekeepers or for themselves related to beekeeping What's big on your list that you really want and you're going to pull the trigger and thin your wallet because thick wallets are bad for your back. You're going to find out what's going on. Marlon was the man. Jim's in trouble. <laughs> that's true. And that's, by the way, you know, the other cool thing about running into somebody like that, um, it was like meeting somebody's grandfather. His wife was there. They were just laid back. He was just at a picnic table like everybody else. You go over and to everybody else, they'd already known him because he had been affiliated with the St. Louis Zoo for so long. But it was, you know, better than meeting Marsha Brady. You know, I mean, this guy, he's the guy. Marlon Perkins. Anyway, would have been so starstruck to have met Marlon Perkins. He's just, he acted like a normal person. It really, that, the star part, the, the being in shock really passed fast, you know, because then he just talked about things. It was fun. Uh, glad to, glad I made the show. How's the bees? This is Canadian beekeepers. Oh, that's Ian Stepler. We just talked about him. So he's right here. 
Canadian Beekeepers blog. So uh, again, Brian, Ian, all you guys that produce your own content, how do you have time to stop in on anyone else's live stream or comment on videos? I have no idea. I'm, you know, I don't produce that many videos a week and I'm overwhelmed with the stuff that I have to do. Uh, let's see. I found my marked queen dead in the front of the hive. Strong colony. Have a very small colony guaranteed. Let's see. To die this winter. How would you introduce this queen to the large colony? It will be 40 out. Okay. You're not going to like my answer. And this is from Tritone. And I'm glad you asked it because this is something that a lot of people are going to notice. If you've got a dead queen, would I combine this time of year? Would I take a colony that's in failure mode? and combine them with a the colony that's surviving and doing okay. Personally, I would not. Here's why. I have a colony that's doing well on its own. I don't need to bring in a bunch of other bees. Now, is that cruel? Not really, because here's what they're going to do. Think about it. They're going to live out their lives. They're not going to have another queen. They're not going to get mated this time of year. And so they will just live out their lives, consume the resources they have, and then just die through attrition. So I don't see that as cruel. I also don't think that boosting another colony this time of year, end of November, 1st of December, this is not the time to combine colonies. To take them apart to do it, you have to add the other box. So you've added space, unless they're bringing in a massive amount of honey with them. Uh, I personally would not do it. Let them live out their lives. You're not killing them. They're not dying early. They're just not getting replacements. They'll just dwindle. So that's what I, that's what I say. And so uh, Umar says, uh, bought 20 hive huggers and they are $33 each. R32 though. Now, so here's the question. Do you need R32? That's household insulation, by the way. Uh, there are, there's BOCA, which is a building code in the United States. And you have a mandatory amount of R value in your attics. R32 is right up there with a home insulation rating. So my question again goes back to, do you need that much insulation? In other words, you hit a point where your bees survive, your bees do well, they're brooding up when they should, they're, they don't appear to be under a lot of stress going through winter, they're not consuming most of their resources. So in other words, have you hit the acceptable limit at an R10, you know? So sometimes, because I can say, R, well, you don't need an R10, you need an R32. Do you really need that, though? And the other thing is we're talking about the hive cover. So there's a lot to think about, which is why I highly recommend wherever you live that you make incremental changes and that you don't change all of your hives at the same time make configuration alterations and do this consistently, keep really good records. And when you realize that your bees are coming through still with a surplus. So right now with insulated inner covers on my hives uh, at an R10, they're coming out without having consumed the 40 pounds of honey that they were keeping on. Now back when I was venting my hives and I had an upper entrance and things like that, I kept an average of 70 to 100 pounds of honey to get them through winter because it's like leaving your furnace on full blast. They had to consume a lot of calories to generate enough heat to keep themselves alive in a space like that. But now with just the R10 over the top, they're making it through and there's surplus, there's harvestable honey in spring. So I don't know if jumping up to an R32 is necessary if they're doing well at R10. I'm just, you know, so we try to have an economy of material and, uh, $33 per hive cover, that's pretty That's pretty steep. I mean, if it makes a big difference, that's it. So for those of you who already have insulated covers, and then we add the R32, the hive huggers that we're talking about here now, um, if one really has a vast improvement uh, that's measurable, that's quantifiable, it's not just, oh, I think they did really good. I think they did great in that. We need to find ways to find out. That's where That's where building code comes from. There's something called specification structure. In other words, minimum spec, right? So that means it was good enough. So in other words, if it works, is more better? Not always. So you have to find out, you know, at what level your bees are coming out healthy, vibrant. And if you don't need more material, I personally see no reason to add more material. That's all I'm saying. So 
What else we have? Quite a good flow at the moment. Bees are moving like it's spring. And that's the Dominican beekeeper. And Kodiak Farm bees. What else do we have here? Whatever the wall is, at least double the R value for the roof. That's true. Lambrook Farm made a good statement here. We want the dew point to occur on a sidewall. We don't want to occur on the inner cover. So we don't want to be directly over the bees. So yeah, I've and this has puzzled me sometimes. I'll see people buy hive wraps, hive cozies, and heavily insulate the side. They'll wrap their hives, and then I see a normal Luon inner cover on and a telescoping hive cover, hive lid on that, and no insulation. So what they just did is warmed the sidewalls of their hive, or at least it's not actually warming it, but it's preventing the movement of warm air to a cold surface, right? So, but then where's the cold surface now? Directly over the top. So that is very important that if you have insulation that you start with the inner cover and if you add more, then you migrate down to insulating the sidewalls. But if you're going to insulate the sidewalls of your hive, you should have already accomplished insulating the inner cover and outer cover above to make sure that that is never where the dew point is achieved. So. Good point. I'm glad you brought that up. So Bob here says, hi, Fred. Could you talk more about your long laying hive? Any other improvements you might do? I'm planning on building one this winter with a shim box and the screen bottom. Okay, so that's Bob. Um, we are updating the prints on that. So Ross Miller did the drawings, the technical drawings for me there. And uh, several people have built from those drawings improvements are insulation related. So the other thing is whether or not you have that shim underneath, um, the whole purpose of the shim underneath, so people that don't know what we're talking about, the long Langstroth hive is built around the standard Langstroth deep frame. So the way my design is. Now, we also offer the screen bottom board with removable trays because that's passive control of row destructor mites. Also, any condensation that goes down the side walls will end up going through the screen into the trays that can be tended in wintertime. There's also a shim option in the design. And what that does is it takes your deep frames. This is a medium frame, but I'm just going to use this for an example. So this is your long Langstroth hive, right? And if you have the shim underneath, so if this were the standard deep frame, there now is a three inch space underneath. This is also part of your integrated pest management. It also satisfies people that want to collect honeycomb because what the bees do nine times out of 10, they're gonna draw down on the bottom bar of this. They're gonna draw more comb. And what they do is they build, again, most often, they could actually do anything, but they most often build uh, drone comb down there. That's the purpose of that space also, because then when you're pulling these frames up, there's drone comb down here. You'll cut it off the bottom, collect the comb. You're also doing integrated pest management because you're pulling out, hopefully, drones in the pupa state, which means you're taking out row destructor mites with them. So that would be a valuable part of integrated pest management for those who want to manage the pest in a non-treatment way. So that's what that's about. So you have the option of that deeper bottom. And again, do both and see what you like the most. I realize it adds cost, but one of the things that I like, it's just the cost of materials if you're building it yourself. And these horizontal hives are designed to be built by people with basic carpentry skills. You don't have to be some kind of cabinet maker to put it together. They're heavy. And that's my point too. This is a backyard beehive that other than the lid being open so you can access all your frames, you build it to a height that's comfortable for you. You eliminate it, all of your lifting. You expand the height. This is why the supervisor, when he shows up, my eight-year-old beekeeper, I want him to have a horizontal hive. He has other plans. And I told him he can have any kind of hive he wants, so I'm kind of stuck. But he can have a horizontal hive, and he can tend that whole thing while I stand there and do this. Hmm. Oh, yeah, watch out. Good job there. Okay. Because he can lift a frame, he can move a frame aside. And so the screens, he can pull those bottom trays. The bottom trays are very informative. 
you're going to know if you have resident varroa mites. You're going to know how many of them are dropping in there. You can spray those. And they're designed to be cafeteria trays, so they're dirt cheap. There's no specialty item in this thing. So the horizontal hives, the only thing that I did not do that I changed later is I did have rigid foam board insulation in there. I did not know at the time that I started designing that is that um, I would find double bubble and how convenient and lightweight and easy and effective it is. So now we use double bubble up inside the cavity. And I like that to be up there. I also use double bubble as a gasket material around the full circumference because that's the other thing. It was leaking air around the edges because those edges are out of reach of the bees. Therefore, they didn't get propolized. So by adding double bubble, we ended up with a huge population of bees making it through winter. So it helped with condensation management because now the sidewalls, they're not insulated, but they're full two by material. So, and because they're built so heavy, you can build them in place. And now you've got a really heavy hive that, by the way, we had 60 mile an hour winter wind gusts blowing that thing. It is not strapped down and it wasn't even budging. So there's a lot to be said for picking a position for a backyard hive like a long Langstroth and having it in a static location with the convenience of never having to lift a box. So um, what else would I change? I did kind of lean towards the Lyson hive stands later, but, uh, and we did a bunch of different hive stand designs, driven T posts. I even took angle iron that was galvanized and we drove that in because you support your hives with compressional weight on the soil or friction when you drive it further in. So the different hive support systems were something we played around with. Because remember, the hive by itself, before you put anything in it, is going to weigh about 160 pounds. So, um, But other than that, all the things that we included in those prints and drawings um, are going to stand. We're not going to change anything, at least yet, because everything that we implemented is going to remain the same. So for the horizontal hives, if you're building one, uh, check those plans on Sunday, because if Ross Millard has updated the plans, then we're going to have the current plans there. And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, if you go to the way to be.org, there's a page marked, I think it's prints or plans. I don't know which it says they're free. You just, it's a PDF. You click on it, you download it, you print it out, modify it to suit yourself. It can serve as a starting point. Uh, we know that the feedback is really good. They work extremely well. And the only thing it would improve is how much insulation you put in the top of it. So it's good stuff. And people do send me photos of the versions that they build from that. And there's some real craftsmanship going on out there. Because again, if you never have to take it apart, if you never have to move it, it doesn't matter that your overhang goes bigger. It doesn't matter, you know, how ornamental it is or how much it weighs. Once it's in place, it's in place. It's done. It's good to go. You don't have to add boxes or anything. You're just it's an accordion. You're adding frames. Then when they have too much space, you reduce the frames or you pull frames out for harvesting. Follower board comes right back in and you have all that storage space over there. So you're not even bringing out a bunch of stuff to put in frames when you expand it. You're out there. You look at it. You say, oh, they need room. Eight, eight out of 10 frames are full. Let's add some more. You slide your follower board over and you take boards from storage and you put the foundation and frames right in there. They're expanded. It's that easy. Very easy. Keith Spellman says, do you have a particular book you like your students to read before you start mentoring them? That's interesting. A book I require, I have no required reading. Um, I will tell you the very first most basic beekeeping book uh, I ever read was Kim Flotum's uh, Basics of Beekeeping or something like that. And uh, that was in 2006, a little paperback. I don't have any required reading. I will share this. Um, if you're putting together a course or a program, I was talking to Greg Burns about this because he's putting together a curriculum for his uh, teaching yard there in Ohio. Um, now, I'm retired from the Navy. A lot of people know that. My wife is also. My wife was a master training specialist. She was also a company commander. That's a boot camp drill instructor, for those of you who don't know. So she's much more dangerous than she looks. Um, we had something called PARS, which were advancement requirements, right? Personal advancement requirements, PARS. I like that idea of a three-ring binder that you give out. And if you're in a B club, 
or you've got a bunch of beekeepers you're trying to mentor, it's going to be hard to keep track of their progress. They might miss a meeting. They might miss a practical factor, right? So if they have a three ring binder that has things they need to know, in other words, you read about it, you learn about it, start with bee biology, of course, because everything works outward from understanding the insect we hope to keep. And once they know those things, they satisfy that by answering those questions to somebody else who's in the know, a designated person that can sign them off. Scouts probably have this. So then you, you sign off what they've done. And then there are things they have to observe happen in a bee yard. They get signed off for that. There are things that they have to demonstrate themselves. And it can be as basic as, can you put on a bee suit? What are the elements of a bee suit? What's the purpose of it? Can you light a smoker? What are the importance? You know, what's, what are the considerations of lighting a smoker? You know, what should the fuel be and everything else? What's the protocol for walking into a bee yard? These are all sign-offs. So you develop a book that has practical sign-off segments and things that people have to accomplish. And everyone should have that book. And I brought this up for another group that I won't name because it's a national group. And I thought, why aren't we doing that? And they said, no, we don't want to be that formal. I said, it's nothing to do with being formal. It has to do with making sure that we don't skip over anything and that we're putting prepared beekeepers out in their bee yards. That's to benefit the bees. That benefits the beekeeper. So rather than a required book, you know, some people don't like to read books. So you could tell somebody that's mandatory reading. You could be like me back in the day and get cliff notes and pretend you read the whole thing and just talk a good game, you know. But uh, I think mandating a specific book for someone wouldn't necessarily work. And so I think uh, teaching them and having little chunks, little lesson plans that describe very specific tasks and then get them through that bit by bit. I think that's kind of the best way to go. So um, does, this is a good one from Darren Nickel in the UK. Does Mrs. Dunn have any up and coming new chicken artworks? I hope she doesn't listen to this because that got me in trouble. Um, <laughs> when I talked about her little chicken drawing, for those of you who know it, and by the way, thank you to all of you who bought that shirt and sent me pictures of you wearing that shirt. She spent half a day explaining to me how she was in a hurry, how she could have done a better chicken. And uh, I'm going to try not to laugh about it. She was in a hurry. And then she said she needed to do it because I can't see and, and like it had to be big on the. So anyway, she drew a very realistic looking chicken. So if you want to find it, you Google realistic chicken art and then, you know, it, the way to be or Fred's fine fowl and you'll find it. You'll be impressed. It looks like a, it looks like a photo on a shirt. So, um, and, uh, let's see, have you ever worked as a stand-up comedian? No, I don't know why that would be a thing. I would not, let me, I like picking on people for fun because I grew up with three sisters and, uh, cutting each other down was, was a lot of fun, but, um, I don't like being thought of as a funny person because people walk up to you with strangers and they go, say something funny. This guy's really funny. And then I don't know what to do. But if you want some, you know, tongue in cheek, dry wit, if you're going to go to, um, you know, the North American uh, conference there, that's my, um, it is infotainment. So if you come to my presentation at the Honeybee Expo, it's a lot of video, it's a lot of photography, and it's storytelling. Uh, the best thing someone can say at the end of a presentation is, that's it, it's over. Uh, and they've been sitting there for an hour and a half. There's your compliment. So that's, uh, yeah. So have I thought about being a stand-up comedian, funny on demand? I like people that have no expectations and I avoid disappointment that way. If you come in and say you're funny, they expect something. I like exp expectations to be at zero. So Keith says, hope to see you, Randy, Mr. Ed, at the Expo on stage again this year. By the way, those of you who went there last year, do you know that was completely unplanned? Like, I just saw my name and it said, Fred Dunn, Randy McCaffrey, and Mr. Ed, cutouts and cutups. So I haven't done any cutouts, so I'm pretty sure I was the cutup. So uh, here comes from the Canadian, I enjoy 
the banter back and forth and picking on each other. And that's just a lot of fun. That's natural. Uh, Canadian Beekeepers blog. If you had to give one presentation on a topic of your choice, 50 minutes, what would that be? That's easy. The plight of the drone in the beehive. Easy to tell the story. It ties in biology. It lets you know who's running the show. The question is how to how to title something. I give very generic uh, titles when people ask. The favorite thing that I get from any club that asks me to talk is, uh, what would you like to talk about? I always say honeybee biology. Or I'll just say, um, you know, the amazing honeybee or, uh, you know, be inspired. And it's because my whole thing is to show you the inner workings of the honeybee in a way that you haven't seen it before. So the things that you see, if you're where I am in person, you will not have seen on my YouTube channel. You don't see it on my website. Why on earth would I show up somewhere and heaven forbid be paid to stand in front of people to talk to them about bees and show them or recap something I just showed them on my YouTube channel. So part of it is you get to be there and interacting with the people that are there is the biggest thing, but easily it's bee biology. So it's bee centric. Last thing I want to do is get in there and talk about hive types. Heaven forbid somebody wants to have me talk about bro destructor mites. I mean, you've got Dr. Sam Ramsey for that. You've got big shots that have done doctoral level research on these things. The last person you want to hear from on that is a backyard beekeeper. So where's my strength, right? It's in images and cinematic experience. So that's what's exciting to me is to come in, show someone something in a way they've never seen it, and then change the way they view the bee. Honeybee appreciation. So Cayman Reynolds is really good at that. Uh, I just told him I want to be, I want my talk to be titled Honeybee Appreciation. Well, what the heck does that mean? Who cares? It leaves me in flux. So that up until the moment that you walk out on stage and you bring up a photograph, uh, it leaves it in the air. And, and the whole point is to get into the minds of people. That's what I'm about. So that's my topic, Honeybee Appreciation. And I like to bring up the plight of the drone because, yeah, I, I didn't even want to get into it because uh, I'll blow part of my whole my whole stand up routine is is about that, the caring honeybee. So that would be a title, the caring honeybee? Question mark. Do they? Because when you see how they treat drones, are they really that caring? So it's storytelling that informs. And guess what? For Ian, again, the best part of it is it may not make you a better beekeeper. So what I talk about in a presentation may not improve your winter survivability. It may not improve how you keep bees. But what it will do and what I hope to do is inspire you to see the bee in a new way that makes you your mind is blown a little bit by what's going on and what we used to think of as a very routine activity in a beehive. I want to take you in there. I want to take you deeper. So, and for those who haven't seen it, I'll give you an example while I'm self-promoting here. These are the things that excite me personally. And I just use YouTube. And if somebody happens to watch it, yay. But people don't seem to be that excited about the things that I consider to be big achievements in bee observation, right? So I think cinematically. So there are a lot of you know, I've made music videos and stuff like that. I know, it's weird. But when there's a whole bunch of actors and a crew around and they have set apart these huge chunks of time to do things. So what they didn't realize is I'm a running gunner. So I walk up, I screen people, I fire people. I don't want you. I don't want you. Get rid of the Walmart bag, blah, blah, blah. And I get, I distill them down to the group I want. And then I've already got it worked up in my mind. So we do shot after shot, scene after scene. And guess what? No retakes which blows everybody away. But I think in this way. So when I'm making a YouTube video, bees on a tree branch, and you can look at this one on my channel. It's underappreciated. I love it. If I show you a cluster of bees on a, on a tree branch, you think, ah, oh, yeah, cluster of bees on a tree. Who doesn't show that? Everybody who deals with swarms shows that exact thing. But now I want to get you closer to the surface of the bees on the tree branch. So next thing you know, the whole screen is full of nothing but bees. Next thing you know, the screen is full of five bees. So that, see, I've already got you there. You're looking at bees so close, it fills your screen. 
But now you actually go in contact with the surface of the bees and it gets better than that. You just went inside the cluster. Not only did you now go inside that cluster of bees and can view inside all the movement that happens in there that we don't know anything about looking at what's on that branch, that lens had to have its own light. We're hearing the bees walking over the camera. So now there's an audio rig that has to go into that cluster of bees too. For me, that's a major achievement. For the person who doesn't even watch the video because they saw it and it's like, eh, bees on our branch, let's get closer. If you understood what it takes to do those sequences, you would maybe appreciate it more. So that those that inspires me and that's my strong point that's why that's the foundation that i build on if i'm going to give a presentation somewhere i am not even going to try to compete with the dr pax of the world or the dr Seelys. when you see these people on the list dr marla spivak's going to be there those are the scientists i'm your entertainer so who just happens to know about bees as well but i'm not even going to compete on that ground so therefore I give you infotainment. So if you come to my thing in January, that's what you get. So there I gave a whole 20 minute talk about that. So what are we talking about now? It says, uh, I understand you use this platform to inform and educate us with your bee wisdom, but you have never considered making an audio book on the subject. It would be possible monetary avenue. So that's from, by the way, that screen name, Shitty Poop. Are you kidding? That's highly inappropriate. So anyway, um, I like audiobooks. I like narration, um, but I haven't written a book. So if somebody wrote a bee book and they wanted me to narrate it, I'd be all over that. But again, my voice is a very specific appeal. Uh, there are some people that are very off-put by my voice. Other people really like it. So. If you're that, if there's that much of a division, I don't think my chances of being picked up as a voice actor or a narrator. I would love to narrate a Tom Seeley book. That would be awesome. But uh, I just don't. Here's, uh, let's see, the Morris Homestead Girls. Hey, Fred, if I run out of Hive Life fondant, what would you recommend I put on top of my insulated inner cover? I would go right to dry sugar. That's the next thing. And uh, you can do that mountain camp method. You know, if it's already on your insulator inner cover, though, use your wrap it round, stick it in there, fill it with sugar right up to the top of your little cone, and then uh, let the bees get to that. But if you have access to the Hive Life fondant, I definitely endorse that. I would use that first. And uh, But if you're going to run out, have sugar as your backup and keep tabs on it. So... Uh, what else do we have? Let's see. Ian, doesn't everybody leave the peg in February? What are you doing? You're the man, Lambrook Farm. Thank you. That's the videos I love. And your close-up flowers, Shannon. Thank you. But, yeah, I don't want to mention a video I have coming up. And you know why I don't? Because if I tell people about a video that's coming up, and then I don't do it. So my... Is this a dumb idea? I mean, we're live. We're just sitting around talking to each other. I wanted to, because I'm also an illustrator, so I'm an artist, and I thought it would be cool to illustrate a honeybee or the drone or whatever in detail and while drawing it in real time, make the video, but describe the anatomy and the function of the bee while we illustrate. Does that have appeal or is that dead on the vine? Is that just a terrible idea? So, because we did the pyrography, you know, so we're, we're burning wood. So it's just a glorified term for wood burning and uh, stuff like that. So uh, that's what I'm thinking about doing because I want to set a camera right here, show the panel, and it's etch out a highly detailed image of a bee while we talk about you know, all the different facets. And then that, see, this is how I think. It's linear again. So we have the concept. We illustrate the bee. We make the video about the bee. And then once I'm done with this illustration, then we transfer it to digital media and then it becomes a shirt and then you buy it. You, you buy my B shirt that you saw me draw. And then if I were a real capitalist, I would sell the original drawing. But I keep those. So 
There you go. Anita would watch it. Uh, have you ever heard of David McFawn? He wrote the book Applied Beekeeping in the United States. I haven't, Rodney. See, there's so much out there. My bee library is pretty extensive. I haven't even... Oh, with the XYZ of bee culture, I've got this photography book back here that's off the chart. Uh, dabble with photography a little at Sarah's Happy Hives. Every, You know, if you're a beekeeper and you take up photography as a hobby, so worth it because you can capture the things you witness. And you can be one of those annoying people that uh, goes to parties and wants to show pictures of your bees. Look, and here's queen laying eggs. And here's the bees feeding each other. Look, they're getting pollen right there. Wait, I have more to show you. Come over here. I mean, if somebody shows you pictures of their babies or something, or worse, their grandbabies or their sister's babies or somebody's kids, you just start breaking out pictures of your bees. You just start showing them. And these are the little eggs. And here they were at three days old. They, they hatched. The eggs hatched. And you want to see that. and Get them back. Somebody tried to pay me one time not to talk about chickens. Did not work. Keep your money. Hello from Scotland. I really enjoy your content. I'm learning lots from your channel. Thank you, Colin Kirk. And uh, what else we have? I'm thinking about getting a thermal camera so that I can easily tell if my bees are still alive during winter. Which ones have worked best for you in seeing where the cluster is? Okay, so I have the FLIR C2, which is the old camera. They don't even make it anymore. Uh, but there's also a FLIR that goes on your cell phone, which I don't have on me, but it plugs onto the end of the cell phone. Let me tell you why I like it. You're looking at it through your cell phone screen. And if you want to record something and your cell phone can make a video, you record the video of it. You can do a screenshot. So it's the FLIR. I guess there's a couple of versions. Randy McCaffrey uses it too. I really like that because it plugs into the end of your phone and takes up no space, little pouch you carry it around in the battery, it goes for a long time. So you can take still images, thermals. You also decide the color spectrum. So if anybody's a little colorblind or something, you can pick what looks best for you. And it is a lot of fun to go out there. And here again, this discussion about insulated hives, uninsulated hives. The insulated hives, I have a very tough time figuring out exactly where my bees are located in the dead of winter with a thermal camera because it reads surface temperature. So if you go out there and uh, you have the three quarter inch wood, for example, you're gonna see exactly where the cluster is. And they're all this year, every one of my colonies is in a perfect spot where they belong near the entrance with lots of honey up above them. So they are starting off the year great. And there's, it, somebody says FLIR One Pro. That's it, probably. It's a good one. Whatever the best one is, just get it. They're great. Um, so here's the thing. When you go out, this is about your emotional well-being. So you go out there, what, what, does it, what does it help you to know how many bees are alive or not? It's very fulfilling because we're just in the worry zone. So uh, once winter hits, you're just waiting it out for when your bees are going to fly again. And the more north you are, the longer that wait is. So I really like it when we get this warm, sunny day and you get to go out and see bees fly out and bomb into the snow. Somebody else mentioned, they said Canon or Nikon, like, like those are the only two camera makers on earth. You know, they're skipping over Olympus and everything else. Sony, right? But yeah, I'm a Nikon guy. Totally. I mean, absolutely. Nikon Z9. That is the camera right now for me. So anyway, um, you need to know what your bees are doing in wintertime because you need to know. It's knowledge for knowledge's sake. It won't change anything that you do, but it does help you feel good about it. They're alive. The cluster is a decent size. Good chance there's a queen in there because the cluster size is not dwindling. If you're absent a queen, you're going to see that heat signature get reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced. And then you know they're just dying out through attrition. So um, what else? That's pretty much all I can say about that. Kodiak Farm Bees gives a thumbs up for Nikon. It's good enough for NASA. Okay. So Shane Ziggy's bees, Fred, with your camera and video quality, could you possibly dissect the honeybees showing the inner anatomy or would that be too much? Okay, so that's actually a really good question. Now, here's what I want you to do. If you're watching right now, get out your note paper and look honeybees under a microscope or microscopic honeybees, Frederick Dunn. And I already did it. Now, I did not dissect them. 
and here's why. Uh, there's lots of that work has already been done. If you go to any topology, any topology, any department of entomology at any university, you're going to see the you know the little slides, the microscope slides of the bee's head, you know everything. It's all they're already sliced and and done. And uh, those images exist, and I think they're even in some cases in public domain, which means that if you needed images that are microscopic slide photos, and you can even buy sets of those, by the way, um, if you get those, it's already been done. So for me to dissect it, a lot of work. I'd much rather collect these landing board bees in wintertime. Uh, they're in good shape. They're, they're starving or they're cold or they're already dead. Here's one of the things that uh, if you're a new beekeeper and this is your first winter, I want you to do what I tell you to do right now, which is very important. When you go out and you see these dead bees on the landing board, scoop them into a Ziploc bag and, of course, mark the, the hive that they came from. Then you go in your house, you go in your kitchen. That's the preferred space because most people have good light in their kitchens. You want that morning sunlight coming in there and you dump out all your dead bees on plates and you get your, your magnifying glasses out. Then you go get coffee and you come back and half of those bees are on your windows because they weren't dead. So that's one of my favorite things. And the reasons I bring it up is those bees are in a, they're going to die. They really are. They're on the landing board. They're outside of the hive. If they were, if they had a real survival instinct, they would have already migrated inside the hive because the cold snap didn't happen like a snap. They are out on that landing board. They got too cold. They torpored and they sat down and they stayed there. They're on their way out. So when you collect those bees, and if you have a microscope, so that's probably the next question that comes up. What kind of microscope do you get? Well, I have several. So I use Celestron stereo microscopes. Some of them have the camera, the third hole for the camera body to go on. And then you have a lens adapter and now you're shooting through the microscope. But so you take these bees that you think are dead and this is why I mentioned the uh, microscopic honeybee video, because what happened was I put them under the microscope and I have all this auxiliary lighting, by the way, because it takes a huge amount of light to get the kind of resolution that you need in a video sequence. And so what they start to do when I was looking at them to get these ultra close ups, you saw that their, their tarsal started to move a little bit. And I thought, oh man, these things aren't dead. So then pretty soon you start to see all this hinge movement, you know, their exoskeleton, how it's put together, all this, they come to life under the microscope. And that's what that video is all about is I think there's another one. There's a drone in there. There's a worker bee. Now you get to see its body come to life under a microscope because these are bees that were dying anyway. Now you brought them into a warm area. So they're going to extend their life for a couple of hours. But so things like that can break up your winter, give you a greater appreciation for the anatomy of the bee. So that's another thing. Get a good bee book. If you talk about books that you should read, any of the books on honeybee biology that are heavily illustrated, I think these are very important for you understanding really what a tiny miracle a honeybee is and how their bodies work. And so when you can bring those in, put them on a plate or whatever you do, and if they die and they don't come back around, that's that's fine too, because they were dying anyway. But um, it really lets you establish a greater appreciation for the honeybee and just how it functions. And that was the whole point of that uh, micro video, because if you have a YouTube channel and you're going to video it anyway, why not put it out there for others to see? People don't see drones except beekeepers. That's a male honeybee. You're not going to see them in your garden. You're not going to see them foraging on dandelions in the neighborhood. So if you're seeing drones, that is something else that's very unique for the beekeeper to see unless you happen to be near a drone congregation area. So you're seeing things. You have access to things that the general public does not. So what else? Uh, with your video, could you possibly dissect? So yeah, I went all the way around the barn on Shane Ziggy's bees. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to dissect them. I did that to look for, because that's the other thing I thought of. Uh, why don't we show people how to look for tracheal mites, right? So we know that the first um, spiracles on the bee are on the thorax, that their, their wings vibrate or the muscles vibrate, and they're next to the leading thorax. And these tracheal mites use that vibration to find their way into that spiracle which means they're in the trachea 
And now you you take the head off and you dissect the bee so you have access to that part of the bee to see if they have tracheomites. I'll tell you right now, there just aren't that many people that are interested in seeing that. I used to do it to find out if my bees had tracheomites, but you had to do it to show that you knew how to find them. So beyond that, it really wasn't that, it's not that exciting to look at the innards of a bee. So same thing with the nosema counts. You know, we did that because I wanted to know if this, it wasn't the hive alive fondant, but it was the hive alive syrup. The claim was that it would reduce um, nosema spores. And to do that, you need a microscope, you need a hemocytometer, which is a slide that's done for, for counting blood cells, right? And then you need a powerful enough microscope to do all of that, just so you can crush up their abdomens, add water, draw the water out, put it on the hemocytometer. And then now you have to look to see, you know, what the nosema spores are. So just seeing a reduction in, in nosema spores from hive to hive, those treated, those not, controls and things like that, it showed that it was working. So now what? I stopped doing it. So let me tell you what, it's very impractical to buy the equipment necessary to do those kinds of evaluations unless you're going to consistently do them and unless that information has real applied value in your bee yard. For most beekeepers, it doesn't. That's why it's so good to be able to do that. I spent the money, I did the work, I validated what was already claimed because that's all I'm doing is, is Oh, is that really so? Does it really work? Well, I'm going to do it myself. And then so when you do these tests and it does come out correct, then you can pass that on and say, hey, man, that hive live stuff, the syrup worked for nozema. What does that mean to me? Well, it means there's less demand on their digestive system while they're trying to get nutrition from the resources they're digesting in wintertime because that's when it's critical. And then if so, nozema spores are not acting on that and reducing the nutrients that they're getting from their abdomen in the middle of winter, then you've got a healthier bee in spring because there's a whole spectrum of levels from my bees are dead in spring to my bees are alive in spring. Your bees, there's a lot of middle ground there to how healthy they're going to be. And a lot of that is under our control. So that's kind of where that's at. So. Now, James Brown says, do you know what tree species is most beneficial to honeybees? Summer, late fall bloomers would be a plus. Okay, well, there's one tree that stands out for me, but it's a, it's a game of patience because I planted a bunch of them, but now they take forever to grow. But the linden trees, the basswood trees. So, um, and it's not, so there are areas, you know, to think about because a cascade of resources. So we want the trees to provide the most for the longest period of time, right? So we also have sumac trees. Those are really good for the bees around here. You have maples. So there are all these different things that act on them. But when you find out things like adult basswood trees, little leaf linden, if you find out that two or three of those things can end up with several hundred gallons of nectar in a hive, right? Um, if you have the bees to take advantage of that, then it's a very powerful tree for that purpose. So here's another way to think of it, because I used to belong to, well, I still do, but the American Arbor Society, right? You get 10 trees, 10 free trees every year or whatever when you're a member. So I did that until I planted 250 trees, and I started that at the turn of the century. So the forest that I have out here, which is all these different hardwoods, all these different varieties of trees that benefit nature, so not just your bees. But even the Washington hawthorn tree, which shows up in spring, that is a huge nectar source for your bees, right? So we have prairie fire crabs. Those are good for your bees. So when you think about a variety of trees, and, and here's why I say that, um, you'll get a pest that comes through. And this is what I was thinking ahead for when I was planting all my trees. If a pest comes through, they tend to be tree species specific. So think of the ash borer beetle. I have all these dead ash trees, right? If my forest had been all ash trees, I'd have lost every tree. So by having diversity, right? So our national tree in the United States, who knows what that is? I like to ask this question when people come to my yard because no one seems to give the correct answer. It's the oak tree. So the year that the oak became the national tree of the United States, I bought 10 varieties of oaks and I planted them all over the place. So 
diversity of forage, diversity of species will be your guarantee that you won't be attacked by some blight of some kind or some insect pest that takes out every tree you have. So when it comes to bees though, that's it. The other thing is, again, we want forage that's on the ground, but see, trees are vertical gardens. So when you have trees, uh, if you've got a small plot, trees are a much better investment than trying to plant, which would not be available to you if you have a small plot. We can plant several acres of some forage, right? But if you don't have all that space, trees are vertical gardens, you get much more out of the space you have if you're planting these larger trees. But linden trees are you know, service berry trees. There's lots of trees that do really well for your bees. That's the first one that comes to mind. Let's see, what else are we talking about? With your camera video, here we go. Do you know a tree species just did it? Let's see, hundreds of trees I've planted. I'm always adding more, planted 14 more this week. So James Barron just planted 14 trees this week. So I've stopped planting trees because they're pretty much maxed it out. But I'm my garden, my plantings are focused on perennials. And this year, of course, like last winter, hyssop. Hyssop is doing really well. So what else do we want to talk about? Have you looked into the Asian hornets yet as they are coming and seem unstoppable? Could be a huge issue ahead. So this is now the Asian hornets. Are we talking the Asian giant hornet, the murder hornet? Um, because uh, that's uh, Vespa mandarinia, which is really funny because the head entomologist for that program up in Washington State graduated from high school right here in my town. So Sven Wiedeger, Svediger, something like that. But by the way, the uh, Vespa mandarinia, which is the Asian giant hornet. I know everybody's talking about the yellow-legged hornet too. So if we're talking about that, that's a different species. That's that's not where I am. But uh, the Asian giant hornet, they think they got on top of it. They They had no sightings this year. None. Zero. And people are all over it. And let me tell you, by the way, this is the power of the multitudes, really, because if you took, it surprises me how many beekeepers only kind of know about bees. And they'll, they'll see uh, yellow jackets in the ground and say, look at these bees over here. And that's a beekeeper. So I hope that we can be more informed about other species out there and what Vespidae is, like what the hornets and wasps are and uh, what the differences are and what their benefits and impact is on the environment because everything's not bad just because it's not a bee. So the yellow-legged uh, hornets are, are a big deal. You know, they do something called hawking. So they hover in front of a beehive and they nab all your bees as they're coming back and stuff. And so then citizen science, man, everybody needs to get out there, learn about that species. That's what I was about to say about the Asian giant hornet the Asian killer, murder hornet, whatever they want to call it. Um, people need to be informed about what they are. And then now citizen science, turn loose everybody you know that can find a method because there's always some super smarty pants person sitting there watching who may not even be an entomologist, but just has a great idea on how to track something or just has an epiphany about, man, I, I think I know how to find their nest. So, because they were hanging dental floss off of them and bits of plastic and stuff like that to track these things. And, uh, but they got a handle on it because so many people turned out to hunt them down to find out where they went or over. Because it looked to me like bad news because you only need one queen to fly out in spring and start an entirely new colony of bees or hornets. There you go, calling them bees. But um, so if you had, Vespa mandarinia under control and everybody understood what they were looking for, then it would have no place to hide. Uh, the more capable these things are, I mean, everybody was, is worried about the spotted lantern fly too. So the more people that know about it, then the more people can act on it. But I tell you what, I don't feel very good about that one because once you find it, nothing gets done. In, in other words, okay, we have it over there. So, I mean, what are we supposed to do? You can't, you don't burn them. You don't, you know, hit them with soapy water. What's the, what's the fix? I mean, some of these things are so successful at survival that 
for us to knock them out means we also have a lot of collateral damage. We knock out things that are beneficial. So they really have to weigh that, right? So for me, the biggest hornet where I live is Vespa Crabro, which is, uh, of course, the European hornet. And they're very passive. So the little jerks around here are the yellow jackets. So uh, even the bald-faced hornet is as mean as they can be. They're not the main culprit for my bees. It's the yellow jackets, which they're not that big. And I have a really interesting video sequence of my bees delivering a little bit of what for to one of those uh, European hornets. They were warming themselves up. It was really cold and they dogpiled it. So get these things on video. So if your phone is great, you know, if you get a really good phone video capability, when you see something weird or see something different, even if it's a species you don't identify or know about right away, get a video or a photo of it that's really good quality. Get really close to it. Don't be afraid. Get right up there. You're a beekeeper. You're not scared of things. Get in there and, and learn about what's going on. So maybe we're coming to the end. It is 427. I didn't realize I talked way too much. I've been on for an hour and 25 minutes. And so we looked in the Asian hornets. They're not doing anything. They're not coming anywhere. The yellow ones are, the yellow-legged. So they need to get on those. Uh, does mori moringa trees grow in the north? See, I don't know anything about that species. Uh, Witch hazel, Lambrook Farm says, latest bloomer in New Hampshire. I'm also in New Hampshire, mentioned the same thing. The yellow leg is spreading in South Carolina, Georgia. Yeah, so people down in South Carolina, Georgia, get on those. Go get them. I wonder if there's a lot of electric tennis rackets being sold down there. Uh, let's see. And killer bees in the ground, and they were yellow jackets. Eradicated them for them. See, James Barron, this is what happens a lot. And um, I don't mind, you know, when somebody says, hey, we have bees. I always ask the usual question. I even made a video that says this is not a bee and so we send the video out and it has a bald-faced hornet has a european hornet has a yellow jacket has bumblebees so that people can look at the video and identify but you know what you find out they won't get close enough to the nest to tell you what they are so if i don't have something to do that particular day or if it sounds like it's really dangerous to a bunch of kids or something or it's next to a playground or whatever i'll go get them for free very anticlimactic for the people that are there to see what's going to happen because they just go up with a black trash bag and clip the branch they're on, drop the branch, the nest, everything right in the bag, close it up and walk away. It's not even five minutes. So um, that's, and then, but then you get a chance to talk to people about it and you know what they are. You're making connections and you're a bee, full service beekeeper. And if there were bees and you can at least talk to them about it. Um, let's see. You mentioned how you use a bleach water solution to clear your comb, frames, recommend it. Doesn't the bleach at some level stay in the combs or at least a residue? No. So this is from Jared Godwin. When you use uh, bleach, even though it will smell like pool water for a long time, the volatile period for that bleach while it's exposed to air and everything is very short. So what happens is the action that it's capable of on those surfaces happens within like the first 48 hours. And so when you, and that's prior to putting your stuff in storage. So this comes into play when we're talking about putting frames of drawn comb away for storage for winter time. And if we're going to wash them out and flushing out old pollen is a really good idea. And then after that's been flushed out, spraying it down with a 10% bleach solution, it has what we call dwell time, which means it just soaks on the surface, dries in. And what you just did is you knocked out any potential for mold to grow on your comb. The other thing is it proves to be a deterrent for moths. Now here's another thing that we think about. So people think of wax moths and putting your stuff in storage. If you're in the Northeast, like I am right here, well, it was below freezing last night. Your stuff in storage is already gonna go through several freeze and thaw cycles, right? So that's where the potential for condensation to form in the surface. And then, of course, to get some mold on your, your comb has the potential to occur. So if you sprayed it with a bleach solution, by the time spring rolls around, you're way out of any bleach being active on the surface. I mean, you're way out of that range. Your bees will go and work it. And here's what I recommend, as I've mentioned so many times before. Um, do half of them with that treatment, spray them with bleach water, and the other half, don't. 
right? See what happens to them going through winter, and you can mark them. Just put a B or a hash mark on the top of the ones that you treated. Then when you go into spring and you're putting them in your hives, see how the bees accept or don't. See what they do with them. The bees don't care at all about the frames you've treated with bleach water. And even if you hold it up to your nose, kind of like laundry that's come out of the dryer that's been bleached or whatever, it still has a kind of swimming pool smell to it. The bleach is no longer active. That's a residual scent, right? But it does continue to defeat mold all winter long. So try it. Do half and half. See what happens. But the bees take right to it. There's no known detriment to your bees when they're put on that. So what else do we have? If so, this method only to be used on dedicated brood frames and not frames you'll harvest from. You can do it on frames you'll harvest from. It does not, there's nothing that disqual disqualifies the honey. There's no enzyme activity there that you're defeating. Remember that uh, when you're harvesting your honey, you are, you know, it's honey. They're going to clean the cells before they even put that in there. So the, the bees are going to do their own maintenance. And uh, it has no impact that I know of at all. And uh, perfectly safe. We're always looking out here in South Carolina. I think they've been found. So we're still talking about bees. I have yellow jackets nest very close to my main yard. Is there anything that I can do to eliminate it? Well, if you have a yellow jacket nest, just go get it, Steve. Go get it. I did a video, by the way, which was fun this year. Um, I had a yellow jacket nest that I let go ahead and continue to, to develop. And it was a base of operations that was running raids on my bee yard. So eventually I had to take care of them. But what I thought about is how tolerant are they really? I mean, so in other words, People meet yellow jackets, especially those in the ground, when they're mowing your yard or something. You get the stories all the time. When I was 10, I was mowing my yard and they were all over my pants. I was stung a thousand times. So it's because we vibrate them, we thump them, because I've done all of that. You know, I test them, see what their tolerance is of my being there. So here's what I did on this video. And if you haven't seen it, I think it's interesting because it did what I described earlier about getting a camera close. I took a endoscope and I put it inside the yellow jacket nest. And here's what I learned. You would have thought that the minute you touch that nest or the minute you do anything to them, because the population, it was, it was a good sized nest, um, that they would just attack you whole hog. And of course I was wearing my bee suit. I'm not just up there. Who do you think I am? You know, Randy, I'm not, I have to have a bee suit. So I'm right up there and I take my, endoscope and I put it inside and I show you it's got its own light source on it and everything but I found out if you're careful and you don't really tear things up you can get away with a lot in fact I was starting to dismantle their nest and cut it apart and as long as I didn't do any fast movements or anything abrupt or any jarring or jamming activities right they let me pull apart their whole nest it almost made you feel bad except that they're yellow jackets so don't feel bad but I found out that if, and I've done that several times before, where if you approach them in a very careful way and just gradually dismantle it, same way with bees, if you just carefully open the hive, you carefully manipulate frames, if you do deliberate, well-measured movements and you're not banging or causing vibrations and things like that, and I'm sure if I went up there and snapped them with a stick, they're going to, of course, come all out and go after everything. So you can solicit a response, but it was interesting to me how easy it was to disassemble that nest if I was very careful and move slow and steady. And I posted that on, of course, YouTube, where else? But you can see it and see what their reaction is. You tell me what you think. But yeah, where you find them, and uh, if they're that close to your beehive, just go get them. Just get that whole nest, dig it out. Get them out of there. Let's see. Darren and Nicola, shame that the bee Bushman has called it a day in Australia, judging by the last post on Facebook and YouTube. You know, that's really interesting that you say that because I don't know what's going on with him. Uh, the bee Bushman, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. Uh, we were supposed to interview, so he asked me to be a part of his live interview series, and he canceled twice. And the second time that he had to cancel, uh, they were just dealing with something. He was not a script about, you know, what they were dealing with there. So, um, 
Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the Bush P man other than there's something going on and he he has stopped making videos uh, right at a time when we were going to talk. I was very I was really looking forward to uh interviewing with him and learning about what's going on. Um I don't know if it has to do, you know, with with his health and well-being or if it has to do with the fact that there's a lot of government control over what's going on with the Varroa destructor mites. He was very um I don't want to put words in his mouth, but a lot of beekeepers there are being heavily challenged by the control measures and the restrictions associated with the spread of the road destructor mite in New South Wales. So, um, yeah, we just wish him well. So if anybody has, you know, a connection with him or um, that's all I did is I only communicated through email. So I just wish them all the best and uh, was sorry that they couldn't have the, the interview. So. Uh, let's see, Shane, Ziggy's Bees, before we treat for mites, we do a check to see if the treatment is needed. Now, when it comes to feeding supplements, how do we know we need that? What is the best way to know um, gut or overall health? So that is the thing. Uh, when it comes to supplements, I'm going to say this about every supplement that exists out there. And what do we mean by supplements? Because there are claims everywhere that are nuts right now. Uh, that's a great question. Do they need supplements? If your bees are doing well, all right? And I know the people at Strong Microbials might not be happy if I say this, but direct fed microbials, um, super DFM, right? Do you need it? If your bees are healthy, if they're doing everything that bees should be doing, and uh, you don't see some kind of sub lethal impact on your bees or something going on, uh, I don't see a reason to use supplements. Um, and this leads me to the only thing I know of that uh, was marketed as a supplement to benefit your bees microbiome and everything else uh, was with a nozema. Nozema is a bigger problem. And of course, we were studying about nozema at Cornell and, and the whole discussion about you know how people are so focused on the varroa destructor mite they're ignoring an, an entire list of things that impact your bees' longevity, productivity, and all of these things, right? So unless someone can really prove that there's been a study that shows that it's a quantifiable benefit to your bees, I highly recommend not spending the money on any bee supplement. Now, what does it mean for something to be good for your, for your bees or for you? So... A lot of people get in trouble when you name a particular company. But all I will say is, um, even if I name a company like that makes honeybee healthy, right? The claim. So what I stick with as someone who shares information about bees and what benefits them and what doesn't, right? Honeybee healthy does serve the beekeeper. Here's why. A lot of people mix up sugar syrup that they use instead of smoke sometimes or they're filling feeders on their bees when they're doing splits or they're making nukes and things like that, because even some people don't feed those. But if you're mixing up a bunch of sugar syrup, it does not have a long shelf life. Sugar syrup can go bad. Sugar syrup can have that black mold in there. And this is why I always say ask questions. Regardless of whatever claims they make about that material, it does serve to extend the life of your sugar syrup. So that means you can mix up batches of sugar syrup that will last you all summer long. And then whenever you need them, for whatever reason, it will still be fresh and usable. That is what we know for sure. Now, then when um, remain skeptical about everything, you know why? Because all of these essential oil mixes are very expensive. So when people make incredible claims about their benefit to your bees, well, how do I know that? And then you'll see, here's here's the problem. So what I want you to know is you can't go to the person selling a product and ask for testimonials, right? I'm a photographer. So if you go to my website and I have a bunch of testimonials, Fred's the best photographer. You got a picture of me in focus, blah, blah, blah. It's the best. So those are testimonials that I approve and I put there, right? That's not a good assessment of whether or not this product is good. I think they did great, blah, blah, blah. We need a scientific method. You need validation that something is going to be a quantifiable benefit to your bees before you spend all this money for it, right? 
So, I mean, what else? I'm sitting here going, oh, Hive Alive fondant, good stuff, right? So here's a five-pound pack of Hive Alive fondant. It's got Hive Alive in it and everything else. But I asked them at the um, Hive Live conference, is this the same as giving the Hive Alive syrup? Because a lot of the formula is in here. So is this a treatment? Is this something that's, this is not a treatment. This is a survival pack to get your bees through winter. So look at this as a sugar, right? Not as a treatment. So when somebody is selling something that is marked as a treatment, you need to look for independent validation that that works. And it can't be somebody that was given 100 gallons of it. It, I mean, that's that's what I would struggle with. If somebody sent me a whole bunch of something and says, hey, tell us what you think. Well, you're inclined to say, hey, it's awesome, right? You want to because you're trying to give back with some, somebody gave something to you. But you have to be honest because you should never sell your integrity. So if something works, explain what part of it works. You know, is it sold as an appetizer? Like, for example, they say it stimulates the appetite of your bees. Those things are easy to prove. So I do basic tests just to see if that works, if that plays out. And uh, if that's the only strength of it, then I know that my bees will actually go for sugar syrup with nothing in it over sugar syrup with anything in it. So regardless of what essential oil you add to it, the sugar syrup by itself is what the bees are preferring. So if it's an appetite stimulant, they already have that, right? So save your money on a lot of stuff until you know. I don't want to make my own fondant because I don't know how, because I'm not good at kitchen stuff. And something that comes already packaged in a pack that's going to get my bees uh, through winter, when otherwise they might starve, that's an easy decision for me, right? I don't think it's a treatment, though. So um, I hope I answered that question. So what would happen if bees consume spoiled syrup? See, that's the next question. I'm glad that question got asked. So what is spoiled syrup? It's not that so much what would happen if your bees consume spoiled syrup. They avoid it. So, for example... If you've got uh, sugar syrup, which is, you know, sucrose and water, right? If it starts to ferment and we can, we know what that smells like, uh, the bees will just not consume it. And then you'll just think your bees aren't consuming it. So it's wasted because now we have to mix up a fresh batch and replace it. And then, because once it starts to ferment, they leave it alone. They're not, they're not going to touch it. I don't know if you've ever opened up a beehive uh, in spring that didn't have a large population that might have gone into fall without curing their honey. In other words, they have open cells with honey in it, right? So then moisture builds up on that in the wintertime, and then you smell this fermented sour beehive. The bees will not clean that up. They won't consume it, right? So that's kind of the same thing with your sugar syrup. You want to mix it up just in time to be used. That's the best case scenario. Now, if you're going to mix up a bunch of it because you do gallons at a time and maybe you only use quartz or whatever, then adding an essential oil, honeybee healthy, pro health, whatever one you choose, uh, will extend that syrup and prevent fermentation. So because it kills the yeast, fermentation has to happen with active yeast, which is there's wild yeast in the air, which will go into sugar uh, liquids and start fermentation. So this prevents that. So what happens if it spoils? So that's just that your bees just don't consume it. So that's the other thing, and I'm glad that was brought up too. Ask questions all the time. There is black mold in the edges of this syrup right here. Okay, the black mold, what's a detriment to the bees? No known detriment. So, you know, in our minds, we want that syrup to be crystal clear, healthy, and have nothing in it but water and sugar. That's what's going to be the cleanest carbohydrate for your bees. And that's the purpose of it. If there is some mold in there, does it get into the digestive system of the bees? If it did, what's the impact on the bees? Unknown. So not negative, not positive. But if it starts to ferment, if you smell it and it's going off, then that doesn't get fed to your bees. Period. Here's another thing. So while we're talking about sugar syrup, what if I don't want to buy Honey Bee Healthy, Pro Health, Beekeeper's Choice, whatever, all these essential oils, right? What if I want to extend that sugar syrup and I want to sanitize 
my um, drinkers in the process, you can put a teaspoon of bleach. I want to say a teaspoon per gallon. Maybe it's a little more than that. Randy Oliver did that research. So if you want to go to scientific beekeeping and look up bleach and syrup, uh, it was proven he had no detriment to the bees, but that, you know, because what's a teaspoon of bleach cost? Like nothing. And uh, that will not only keep your sugar syrup stable, be non-detrimental to the bees, but if you've got these static feeders that you're filling up all the time, you ever watch a YouTuber and they're filling up their rapid rounds or something like that. And the whole thing is just cruddy looking and it has mold all over it and stuff. If they were adding a little bit of bleach to their sugar syrup, they would also be sanitizing their drinkers. So it has benefits. And of course, it's not what you're feeding them all the time, every day, forever. So you don't have to worry about that being something that might have an impact on their microbiome, right? Because if they're drinking bleach, Watch your bees go and drink at uh, swimming pools, for example. So we're talking about a concentration of bleach that would be somewhere in the realm of what swimming pool water has. So, and the bees go after that. I don't know if they're drinking it though. See, because bees use water in a lot of different ways inside the hive. They can use it for humidification. They can use it to control heat. So they're evaporating it away to cool the hive. So they may not actually be drinking and consuming it. They might be using it in a utility way. So unless we know that for sure, um, these are just options that I'm giving you. But if Randy Oliver's done the study and he says it's safe, I'm very inclined to accept and uh, believe what he's uh, tested out. So this is it. Let's see. I used chemical hive alive this fall and the bees didn't touch it. So that's chemical. So we're talking about the liquid hive alive and it didn't touch it, it had to remove all the sugar water. First time they did that, then the syrup was fresh made. Now that's from Patrick Woods. So there is something I wanna say about the Hive Alive. That is a treatment. So if you're using the Hive Alive syrup, here's what I want you to understand about that. And this is very important. If you're mixing up your, your sugar syrup with heat, right? You should not be adding Hive Alive until it's under 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The other thing is more is not better. So if it's two teaspoons per gallon of Hive Alive in sugar syrup, do not go over the two teaspoons. More is not better. In fact, more is worse. When you're dealing with any of the essential oils, they all have toxicity thresholds. Essential oils are not all good for your bees in all kind of percentages, right? So when they establish a benchmark for at what level this treatment gets assigned to your hive, stick to those and don't overdo it because it does have a strong licorice smell, right? So if you've given them a gallon of Hive Alive treated syrup, that was the dose for the hive. It's a treatment. Don't, don't overdo it. So then, you know, you go back to your just your regular honey syrup. And that's an easy test to do. If you put out Hive Alive syrup, and you put out regular sugar syrup with nothing in it, they're gonna use the sugar syrup with nothing in it first. Now here's the thing. So then why have the hive alive? Because it's the impact on Nozema. It's a treatment. So when would you give that? Well, for me, it would be near the end of the year. We've passed the time to be giving that. So the time that I would put out hive alive as a treatment would be at the end of the productive year when they're really desperate for resources. So we've got bees that are out in the environment, they cannot find nectar. Maybe there's some asters left over, something like that, but there's intense competition everywhere. This is the time to be feeding your colonies the hive alive treatment because it's also when they're going into winter and when they're gonna be storing more resources in their bee gut. And that's when we want to make sure that nozema spores are not present or greatly reduced. So that's a treatment cycle, right? So yeah, I would agree. They're not gonna choose a Hive Alive treatment in your syrup over straight sugar syrup with nothing in it. So if all you're trying to do is give them a carbohydrate, there's no reason to, to mix that. Although Hive Alive also extends your syrup just like Honey Bee Healthy, just like Pro Health, just like Beekeeper's Choice, all those essential oil-based mixes all extend your sugar syrup. But what your bees will consume 
over all others will be sugar syrup with nothing else in it. So I think we're going to wrap it up today. Patrick followed all the directions. Yeah, the bees don't choose that over sugar syrup with nothing in it. It is, it is a medication for your bees. So let me just see if I've missed anything and I want to walk away from this. Um, if the queen died in the winter, do the bees, if winter physiology, have enough stores to raise a viable queen if eggs are present? No, they won't. They just won't. They don't do it. And if they did, she would be a virgin queen. She would not be mated. And come spring, that would just be, they're done. Because we need a queen that would be laying and productive because you're losing bees all winter long. And we need to have those being produce some level of replacement bees has to be occurring all the way through winter or you'll have a dwindling cluster that can't keep itself warm they can't forage they can't do all the multitasking that they need to do inside the hive so you need to be able to warm the brood you need to be able to feed the brood when they're in the larva state and so we need to do all of these jobs and if there's no queen producing that hasn't made it and everything the colony is just going to dwindle and die um Let's see what else. Some dandelions are already blooming again. My bees are bringing in red and yellow. Actual pollen is from John Coleman on Thanksgiving Day. See, different parts of the country, man. If your bees can get it, it's if it's out there. Live in Western Washington. I'm planning on selling two lands hives in my shed. I noticed you only insulated the ceiling. In your shed, would you recommend insulating walls? No, because my um, my bee building that has my observation hives in it, uh, that ceiling insulation is it. It's all there is. And uh, it's just basically a shelter from wind, rain, and snow. So it gets just as cold on the inside as it is on the outside. And it gives me a place to work uh, out of the weather. That's all. Uh, what else are we doing? Enjoy the chat. Thanks. Yeah, we're wrapping up here. So if you've got something really pressing that we have to talk about right now, you need to post it because I'm on my way. I'm getting beyond burgers. So let's see. Enjoy the chat. Patrick had the same thing happen. Let's see. Can you remake your sugar syrup if you catch it early from going off? Once it starts to ferment, just get rid of it. Don't. I wouldn't even try to mess with it. Just give your bees fresh sugar syrup with no problems. Uh, Fred, don't binge shop after this. I'll try not to. Speaking of insulation, I used expanding foam and seal off my Apame lid. Louver vents. I had you silicone cock, but it peeled off. For my, uh, this is John Coleman. Um, I just took a single layer of double bubble, put it on under the outer cover for the Apame hives. Close the whole thing up and was not even super tight. So it's a very easy thing. Just one thin double bubble membrane. I didn't do any caulking or any of that. Um, let's see. Happy Black Friday. Thanks, Orlando. And Darren, thanks. It's been great to catch you live. Thanks. I haven't done a live. You know, it's been six months since I did a live. Um, and I don't know why, because these are easy to do. This is satisfying my Q&A for Friday. So I'm glad to see everybody here in real time. And uh, Keith likes the live. So if you like the live talks, this is this is easy way to go. Same with something different from the bottle. Let's see what else. Thanks for live. You're welcome. Is it worth doing a single treatment of oxalic acid vaporization this time of year when it's only reaching as high as the 40s? Um, it's better. So the question is from Jared, whether to do, if you, is it worth it to do an oxalic acid vaporization treatment when it's only going to get in the 40s? I would wait until you hit the 50s and sunny or 60s and overcast. Um, it's better than nothing, but it really has to get into the brood. And if you deliver that oxalic acid vaporization, uh, when they're clustered tight, it just doesn't make it to the brood area. It doesn't reach the nurse bees, which is where the target is. So um, wait until you get a nice 50 sunny day. That's what I would do. I mean, our next week, we're not going to hit that height. So I'm not going to treat until um, we hit that warmth. So, all right, that's it. I want to thank everybody for being here. And we're going to shut down the chat. And if you've got a question that hits you afterwards, please write it down in the video description. 
Uh, those of you who have uh, links to the Hive Hugger, please don't forget to put that down in the comment section. And uh, that's it. We'll see what's going on. I hope you guys have a great rest of the weekend and watch out for stores and stuff. Very good chance you run into people out there. Uh, they're scary species. So thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.